So, good evening, everyone, um, and good morning to our US panelists and participants. I have the great pleasure of being your moderator this evening. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Marie Ennis O'Connor. I'm a communications consultant. I work at the intersection of healthcare, of digital health, and of social media. And to this work, I bring my own personal experience of being a breast cancer survivor. So this topic is of great personal interest to me. So over the next 40 minutes or so, we are going to discuss together the ways in which digital health empowers cancer patients to become more active partners in their care and with a particular focus on co-creating solutions with patients. So to discuss this topic, we have with us um, a wonderful panel of experts whom I shall introduce to you in a few moments. But um, first, for those of you who perhaps aren't familiar with Mericoy, your hosts for this webinar, Mericoy is a global team of very dedicated, very talented people with a clear mission to co-create healthcare solutions that help people better navigate life with the disease. What makes Mericoy unique is the high value that it gives to patient experts. Mericoy's patient experts combine disease-specific personal experience with specialist professional experience that's applicable to healthcare product development and marketing. I'm very proud to say that I'm one of those patient experts, so I speak from experience here. So if you're wondering perhaps about the origin of Maricoy's name, it comes from the Greek word meaning to do something with so much love, so much passion or creativity that you leave a piece of your soul in it. So it's quite a beautiful name. So before I go ahead and introduce our panelists, I just want to take a few moments, some brief housekeeping points. So firstly, as I've said already, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, to help keep background noise to a minimum, your microphone is automatically muted. We have allowed time at the end for questions, so please do take the opportunity to put your questions to our expert speakers. So you should see a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, so you can type your questions in there. If you don't see it or you're not sure how to do that, there's also the chat box function. So just pop your questions in there and we'll get them answered for you towards the end of our webinar. So now, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists this evening or this morning. So our first panelist is Celia Chouquet. And Celia is co-founder of Maricoy, and she's head of strategic partnerships. Celia is responsible for striking new partnerships that broaden impact globally. She has a very personal story of setting up Maricoy, which I think probably will come through. So I'm going to let her tell us that. Uh, when she's not trailblazing at work, you'll find Celia literally trailblazing, hiking off grid with her children, with her husband, and with her dog. Next, we have Terry Coutte. Uh, Terry is a two-time breast cancer survivor. She's a passionate educator and advocate for shared decision-making in clinical care. Terry is the founder of DFC Foundation, which is a nonprofit foundation in the US providing education and resources to empower women and men with information to make an informed decision about options for breast reconstruction after a mastectomy. And Terry is also the host of the wonderful DFC uh, Journey podcast. Then we have Dr. Ninas Krasopoulou. Dr. Krasopoulou is a board certified plastic surgeon a breast reconstruction surgeon and a microsurgeon who has dedicated his professional life to advocating for breast cancer patients. To empower as many patients as possible to advocate for themselves, he has created the Breast Advocate app, a free app that provides anyone with the breast cancer diagnosis or at risk of developing breast cancer a much needed voice in their breast cancer surgery decision making. So we're looking forward to hearing more about this. And last, but by no means least, we have uh, Laurie Chapoutier. Uh, Laurie has more than 20 years of experience working in clinical research in fields ranging from central laboratory activities and lab kit production to biobanking and biomarker operations. 
Being recently diagnosed with cancer, uh, Laurie has completed a patient expert certification and is part of a patient consultant panel, also actively doing patient coaching. So I love this. Laurie says her motto is always driven by her three favorite, favorite P's, patient, process, and passion. There's that word again. So thank you so much for your time. You're all very welcome. Um, I'm really looking forward to this conversation today. And I want to start off by asking you, why digital health in terms of patient engagement broadly and cancer care specifically is such a hot topic to talk about now. And I'm thinking about how um, here in Europe, a policy push helped to enable the use of digital solutions in tackling the COVID crisis. And I'd certainly be interested to hear more about the US system. And at the same time, we're seeing the pharmaceutical industry investing billions and shifting their focus from drug development to more holistic solutions centered around patient care. So Celia, if I can put this question to you to get us started, please. Um, yeah, I think um, over the past um, years, we've seen um, f at least the industry, which is uh, uh, our, our expertise and, and client field, wake up to the fact that uh, launching a drug alone isn't going to, to make a difference, right? That, that it has to be accompanied by um, a whole offering around um, the patient and their needs. And I think that is new fairly. Um, I think before the focus has always been marketing this to the, to the healthcare professional. And, and um, now there's this uh, realization that that's not enough anymore, that actually it needs this treatment decision is a shared decision, or at least it should be between the physician and the patient and that the patient needs to be um, at least knowledgeable about the, the impact it will have on their life. And now with uh, with COVID, I think this has further evolved into the digital field where um, all of this information um, needs to be available in a, in a digital format and, and needs to be um, enabled by, by digital health um, solutions, as well as the products themselves being um, delivered in a, in a digital way as well. So it, there's really been, I think, different waves of awakening, first maybe around the patient engagement and now um, driven, accelerated by, by, by COVID, um, more that the digital health technology part. Um, overall, this is clearly a trend towards democratization of the healthcare system with a, with a patient playing a more and more um, consumer role, even though that, that's not the right word, right? Because when you don't choose to, <laughs> to be sick and to consume. Um, however, there needs to be now this user interface with a patient that, that didn't exist before, um, I think, for, for a lot of our, our clients. So that's why it's become such a push. I think in cancer in particular, um, just the sheer um, innovation that is happening in the field and, and all the new um, treatment options and diagnostic options have exploded. So again, there's this, this need to curate that information to get it both to the patient and the healthcare professional so to make a good decision even possible, right? Things are happening at such an increased um, pace um, in that field that, that there's actually no other way than to go digital <laughs> to keep updated. Um, that's, that's would be from my point of view, some of the, some of the points. So I'm taking notes as well. And Celia, as you're speaking, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this is Terry. This is Dr. Chrysopoulou. So you, you talked about the, um, the shared care. And I know, I know that this is with Dr. Chrysopoulou and, and Terry. I know this is your really hot topic. Um, I wonder, would you like to come in, either of you on this around digital health and shared decision making, shared care? We'd love to hear from you. Terry, ladies first. Thank you. He's always kind to say that. So I'll, I'll take the lead here. Um, you know, I, I see real benefits in digital health for patients. And <clears throat> quite frankly, I, I mean, I hear it from them too. So patients that are using digital health 
these days. I hear back from them directly when they, you know, they will make comments to me like, well, I went into my consult and I was ready. Or, you know, I had everything sorted out before I went into my consult and I came out with a decision I was happy with and I felt like a team member. So I do see great benefits to digital health. Um, What I don't see so much maybe is awareness and also access. Um, I don't think as a cancer patient, generally speaking, we, uh, or or for any healthcare, um, you know, disease for that matter, I don't think once we get a diagnosis, we say to ourselves, okay, well, I have, I have cancer. I think I'll go to the app store now and look for a good app to use. That's the farthest thing from our mind, right? So I think it's really incumbent upon us as um, Celia, I'm going to use the word consumer patient advocates, because that's really, you know, what we morph into when, when we are diagnosed with a disease and Lori, you would know that firsthand too. Um, it, it becomes incumbent upon us as patient advocates, but also physicians and healthcare professionals to, you know, tell pa- patients where they can find these uh, digital health tools and decision, decision aids to make their experience better. So I see true value in them, but on the other end of that, at the beginning of a diagnosis, I believe that we really, ha- we really need to make um, patients aware where these digital tools are and really how they can empower them to be a part of a true shared decision-making conversation. I'm going to bring Dr. Chrysopoulou in in a minute, but I'm, I'm really interested in what you say, Terry. So mm-hmm. I feel what I'm hearing from you is there's almost a step before digital health. And uh, Celia mentioned that there's this need to curate information. So I, I feel you're both speaking the same thing. And I know that, I know, I mean, I know Terry for many years now, and I know that you've got a wonderful website and that you provide this information and you signpost. So do you feel, um, do you feel that there is almost this step before we put digital health into the hands of patients where they need to be signposted? And as, as you say, the awareness isn't there. Well, if I'm understanding your, your uh, question correctly, Marie, from my standpoint, I always say all of this is provided by creating a community of trust. So where does that begin? You know, for me, it's very strange when I think back on, you know, the, the six years and the involvement of my work, I started out telling my story. It was one story, right? Yeah. And, and then I soon came to realize this is not just one story or my story. This is many stories. And they may be stories of triumph and success. They may be stories of, oh, things didn't go so well. What do I do now? Or they didn't go so well for me. And here's how I solved that problem. And so these curated stories, I think, and, and also the development of these communities comes with a huge responsibility. Um, and, and I think trust has to be established by providing really great evidence-based information, uh, science-based resources for these patients so that they can gain that self, uh, that sense of self-control. So I think it's really interesting because if we look at the research, we find um, that patients trust their doctors. Really, mm-hmm. that's the first place, particularly when you're diagnosed with something like cancer. So this seems like a really good point to bring Dr. Crisopolo in, mm-hmm. in here, because if you talk about community of trust, then um, then Dr. Dr. C, if you don't mind me calling you that, I know that's how you go. Um, so do you feel that that's really important as well to bring that trust factor in? Oh, for sure. I mean, the, the, um, there's a massive relationship aspect to this, right? Because good care involves uh, or has to 
uh, involve a good relationship. Everyone's a, everyone's a, the best physician in the world when things go according to plan. You know, when you have the answers, you get great results, especially as a surgeon. And in my world, in breast reconstruction, if the patient gets through their cancer, um, they have, by today's definition, a, a cure, you know, um, that's a very complex definition, but that's another webinar. Um, <clears throat> but, they're, you know, and they look fantastic and they're happy, uh, then I'm the best surgeon in the world. But if I don't have a relationship and the patient develops a complication and then there's decisional regret because they didn't have the right information when they needed it, that's a massive issue. So uh, the information is already out there, but it's so overwhelming. You know, Dr. Google doesn't do you any favors, right? So what's the right information? And really curating evidence-based information is something that we need to be doing up front, as you say, for any decision uh, tool, really that onus has to be taken off the patient's plate. Uh, they don't have the time. They don't have the uh, energy. They're not in the emotional headspace uh, to be able to sift through information and try and garner what's accurate, what's appropriate to them. Um, so absolutely, we need evidence-based medicine to be part of the conversation. Uh, and, and also, we can't confuse... Uh, e-health, right, which is online information, uh, with health literacy, right? And so part of this curation also has to be a focus on the language that we use to ensure that patients understand what we're saying, okay? We've got to really, I mean, we've got to break it down and, and, and then, you know, to, to, to core information and then do it in a way that patients can then use the autonomy that we must provide them, they can then build up from there and get, get you know, as much more information as they feel they need to make the best decision for them, right? So shared decision-making is at the core of all this. You can't have any of this without shared decision-making, right? And then you add to all this the time constraints that healthcare uh, I hate the word providers, but for want of a better term, I suppose, you know, the, 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 all the constraints that we have these days to, in, in, that come in the way of building that relationship, specifically time, you know, in the U S we have a bunch of regulations, you know, one of my, one of my best friends is actually my internist is my physician. And whenever I go and see him, you know, I, I, I tell him, you know, Tim, if I wasn't your friend, I'd be really pissed off because you haven't even looked at me in the eye one time since I've been here. You've been looking at that bloody computer screen. There's no interaction. There's no personal involvement. There's so much of our time that goes into other things that there isn't time for that personal touch. So plus in the US now, and, and, and here's another thing, access, we mentioned access, access it comes in many forms. You've got access to information, then access to the right doctor for you, because not all physicians offer all the treatment options. So if you don't even know what's out there, and then you're in a fee-for-service model like you are in the US, how can you even be sure that you're being given all the options if the physician doesn't offer them? And now you're in a punitive healthcare system that punishes the physician for offering something that they don't offer because now they don't make their living, right? It's very complex. That's a, that's a kind of a um, cynical point to make, but in the US, it's very real because of the fee-for-service system, right? So anyway, lot, I mentioned lots of, lots of different things there, but so uh, I'm actually realizing 40 minutes is never going to be enough for this conversation. I'm still only on question one, and I'm going to bring Laurie in here. I'm, I'm still really focused because I do love that phrase, Terry. You're wonderful with phrases, that community of trust. Laurie, um, where does the pharmaceutical industry fit in that uh, community of trust? Yeah, thank you. I think uh, I was really lacking when you said about trust because you're absolutely right when you are diagnosed with a cancer or any other disease. 
clearly the first thing is that, okay, you can't believe it, and then you have to trust your physician for that. Um, and this is so true that then when the physician is offering whatever medication, whatever treatment, either you just follow and you don't ask yourself and you don't even Google it, but your friends will Google it for you. And then they will say, yeah, I have seen this, uh, this other treatment or something, uh, something different, etc." So coming to pharmaceutical environment, uh, clinical research, this is exactly where I think uh, clinical research and pharmaceutical uh, industry need to be able to to build the trust of patient by having things that are so clear, so transparent that patient knows that they have all the the, the, the possibilities that they, they they could have, etc. So it's really about about that. And I just wanted to add something. I, as you said, I have worked like more than 20 years in a clinical research in in uh, in cancer, and I saw I knew everything about cancer. But when I did become a patient myself, I did realize that I didn't knew anything, and the reality of a patient is fully different of what is written on a paper in a protocol. Say, okay, side effect is nausea. Okay, it's fine, nausea. It's what, is, what is nausea? We all have experienced nausea in our life. It's not the end of the world. But when it's become every day and for the entire day and make your life miserable, this is something different. So what I wanted to say here is that, and probably I'm, I'm jumping on another point about patient involvement and patient engagement, but I think it's so critical for pharmaceutical world, for digital uh, solution, really to involve patients. Because at the end of the day, they are the end user of whatever tool you would put in place. They are the end user of medication or of else, uh, else uh, care solution. So, sorry, I, I did oh, <laughs> jump on another topic. <laughs> sorry, that was so important. And thank you, um, uh, Dr. Krasopolo, you come in. I'm just going to throw sorry. my questions out the window. I think. <laughs> oh, because, yeah, I mean, yeah, that, may be, that may be a good oh, idea. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that last point, um, you know, really was spot on. I, I, I got to tell you, um, you know, when you look at the, the development of breast advocate, it's the perfect use case example. It's proof of concept. So actually, um, Dr. Kutopolo, um, just for the sake of people who are maybe tuning in and, and mm -hmm. maybe not aware of breast advocate, do you want to just take a moment to explain? Sure. That and and let's, that, that, that'll be great. And, and let's use it to highlight the point, the the points that have been made. It's, it's, it's a perfect real life example. Mm -hmm. So I'm a breast reconstruction surgeon. I, I, I help breast cancer patients and those at high risk feel physically whole for anyone who's interested in, in breast reconstruction and, and who feels that's important to them. Um, so I make people physically whole. Um, over the years, uh, I, I, I noticed the recurring theme and that, and that was that, you know, people were coming to me, to us, to my practice, uh, basically complaining that they didn't have the options. They were never told about things, you know, had I knew then what I know now, I would have done something completely different. So I thought there must be an app out there that I can send my patients to before the consultation so they can do their own research with curated evidence-based information that's appropriate to them. Uh, evidence-based, um, I couldn't find anything. So that's how Breast Advocate came about. I put together uh, an advisory board consisting of patients that, um, that uh, represented every treatment group. So uh, breast cancer, different types of breast cancer, uh, high-risk genetic carriers uh, who didn't have a cancer diagnosis or who went on to develop cancer, unfortunately, uh, male breast cancer patients, uh, women who chose to have breast conservation, who chose to go flat, aesthetic flat closure, women who had breast reconstruction, different types of breast reconstruction. And then I had my medical specialists, my co-contributors in terms of medical content. And let me tell you, that process made me a better physician because I saw things in a way I, I, didn't, I, didn't even, I didn't even think, I didn't even know to think in certain terms when it came to the patient and what was important to them. So as physicians, you know, we know all the evidence. Uh, actually, that's hard enough as it is, keeping up with the evidence. So there's another 
another another place where digital health really helps physicians, right? Because we don't have that much time. And so we can't keep up to date with every single article, you know, as much as we would love to. Um, but th this whole process just taught me that um, through all the various versions of the app that I created, the more patient input I had, the more it changed. Because what I thought was important wasn't so important to the patient, right? And, and we're, we're not even done yet. You know, we're... <laughs> You know, we're on God knows what version, but it's not even, uh, I, I'm still not happy, right? So it's still evolving, uh, you know, compared to where I see it being. Um, and we wouldn't even be halfway there if it wasn't for patients. So patients must absolutely be involved um, in the design of any uh, uh, decision aid, uh, whether it's digital or otherwise. Right. So um, uh, I, I, I think for anyone out there in tech, if you're trying to design anything to do with digital health and you don't have patients at the center of the conversation in your planning, um, take that money and give it to charity because it will do way more good. Don't even bother. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I really like what you're talking. Thank you. I really like what you're talking about that that iteration process when it comes to co-creation. So we've brought the co-creation piece into into the conversation now. So I'm back on track with my questions. So Celia, I'm going to shift to you. There's a couple of things I want to to ask you. I want you to to talk, speak a little bit about co-creation and, and patient engagement and and what do those terms mean to you and how do how do you see that? But the other thing I want to talk about is this is very complex. I think almost myself, I've been in this space for quite a while, but as soon as we start talking, we start realizing the complexities around digital health. And what is digital health? It's so many things. It's information. It's where the things are. I'd love you to speak about that. And Celia, I'm really going to put it to you because I just <laughs> want to say one more thing earlier day i was following the discussion from and i know celia knows this conference extremely well the day one conference uh, which took place today in, in basel and i was really struck by a quote from uh, dr alona kickbush which she said we need a mindset shift towards a culture of data justice and equity mm -hmm. to allow digital transformation to really promote the potential of healthcare data so i've given you probably five <laughs> of work, no, but i, I actually but I know that Celia is able for that. So, um, oh, thank Celia, you. Really want to... <laughs> How many <laughs> hours have we got? No, well, that... I'm really conscious. I'm really conscious. I've just got, we're 30 minutes in already, and I just feel we're five minutes in. But, um, but Celia, let us know your thoughts on, on those topics or some of those topics. Yeah, maybe, maybe, you know, very simplistic because that, that was a fantastic uh, presentation and, and, and data is at the heart of all of this. And when our industry clients come to us, it's usually about that. It's like, oh, we have uh, new fantastic ways to capture data so that we can build better treatments or um, track outcomes better or or um, stratify patient populations better so we can treat them more effective right so they see they see the the output the patient outcomes that they can achieve and they don't see a lot of times so they see less that that necessitates an engagement from the user right you're not going to get good data if uh, out of uh, users, especially not over you know a long uh, amount of time with with a lot of different wearable information and enter your weight and enter your mental health status and enter this and enter that unless you're giving something back right we all we all know that in our daily lives we're not going to use a digital product if it doesn't help us uh, serves a purpose in our lives right and and that aspect is a lot of times still forgotten and the other aspect that is forgotten is that you know okay so who owns that data right um, I know again all of us feel more or less comfortable in our daily lives with what you know um, social media 
Facebook, etc., are doing with our data. There's data regulations now around all of these things. So, but when it's then your personal data, then you're extra conscious and 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 so at the one hand you see that this is going to to help you personally because that data can get you better treatment and especially in cancer it can mean life or death right you you have the right biomarker you get the right treatment in the right moment that's your ticket to survival um on the other hand that again it goes back to trust do i trust this whoever is puts puts this digital solution out there enough to to give them that information about me and then is it giving me enough feedback and enough useful information for me to to have a value because if it doesn't then i'm gonna put my information there once and i'm gonna stop so that's where um uh i totally agree um around the the co-creation um that that you did for your app you can't do it without the patients right because you can't develop that value for for patient that value proposition needs to be the heart and center because if you get that wrong you're just not going to get um anything out of that digital um solution sorry that was probably just uh, <laughs> um, no i think no they're, they're extremely important points um i'm just conscious that the time is moving on as well so um I, I just want to, um, Laurie, Laurie, I'm going to bring you in here. Um, I want to talk about patient engagement because it's a term that we hear often. Uh, sometimes I, I think it's become a bu- such a buzzword that we don't stop to think about what it truly means. And actually, I also notice it's a term that's often used interchangeably with patient centricity. So uh, from your point of view, what does the term patient engagement or patient centricity mean to you? And, and Laurie, I'm, I'm good at asking three different questions in one, but there's <laughs> so much that we need to explore but from your point of view when we say what is meaningful patient engagement and how far do you think that the healthcare industry healthcare stakeholders have progressed in achieving meaningful patient engagement okay i will try to answer this three question at the same time so <laughs> patient engagement i think it's a double way it's a meaning engaging patient and as i said i'm really a fan of engaging patient really as as early as possible to not create something that will not never used by patient for either because this is not what they need or because it's too complex for them to use or whatever so patient engagement is meaning engaging patient but it means also patient to be engaged so really feeling part of their um, journey, whatever the journey is. So usually they can be feeling engaged with their physician or with, with the medical team, but I think it's larger than that. Feeling that they have a role to play and for themselves and also for the, the entire patient community. So for me, it's really the two, two ways of thing. Now to come back to pharmaceutical um, world in terms of patient engagement, I'm so happy and obviously two years ago, before I have been diagnosed, I was not really interested myself about that, really. I, I am fully honest. So it's really recent, but I can see that now it's a it's a component of the pharma pharma world, and even there is department fully dedicated to patient engagement, and sometimes even called patient engagement, which for me as a patient give me a, such a big hope on yes, we are there. Patient of their voice, and it start to be somehow mandatory now for clinical research to have patient voice at each step, and it's not only at the end like like uh, to have the the patient happy like okay this this medication will be uh, good for the patient. No, it's at the time of even preclinical research like does it make sense to to look for something i'm speaking about medication sorry but i know the topic is about uh, digital health but it's a little bit the same process that uh, preclinical we need also to think that does it make sense to develop something that at the end of the day will not be necessarily what the patient needs so for me it's really a big hope because I see that really developing now from a patient and the fact that now there is training to become patient experts, that there is really um, 
this uh, panel with patient and those this company having patient as a core of activity like the patient is now like I, I wouldn't say role or job because obviously we we didn't choose this role neither this job clearly it uh, came on us uh, like that but that we can turn it into something positive and that can help the patient community together with the scientific community because obviously if patient community are helping to build something better it will it will benefit as well the science so so yeah sorry i was long no, no, laurie it's fantastic thank you so much i really appreciate so i'm really conscious that there is actually quite a few questions and comments coming in so i do want to be sure that we have time for that so i'm going to skip to my last question but i also want to give you time to talk about the last question i don't want to rush you. so um i wanted to ask if we uh let's finish by looking ahead to the future so i'm going to ask each of you in turn um if we look to the future what do we need to do today to improve the current state of digital health and how do we build solutions that can be trusted by all healthcare stakeholders but most of all by patients so terry i'm gonna i'm gonna bring you back into the conversation again um, looking forward to the future, what are your thoughts about what we need to do today? Well, I, I do want to encourage any patients that are watching, um, and we have patients on the panel, become engaged in developing these apps. I, I want to give you, you know, I just give you the example that I know. I've been asked by other entities, you know, to hop on board and to you know be a part of a team and it uh, it, it is a level of trust so i'm going to give you my my set pat example and it's in collaboration with um dr c on the breast advocate app when he first asked me so so listen to this example in this process i think is is what i'm driving at here for those patients who are listening so when he asked me to be a part of the Breast Advocate app, I, I probably look like this, didn't I, Dr. C? <laughs> um, but it was easy for me to say yes. Why? Because I already had established a level of trust. And it's not because he did a beautiful job on my breast reconstruction. You know, as we are as as we are as we grow as individuals when when we're young children we're taught certain things in life like work ethic um recognizing trust recognizing integrity <clears throat> i was fortunate you know my parents taught me all those skills but then you learn to develop those as as you become an adult with experience right sometimes good sometimes bad what i recognized when when he asked me to be a part of this was his integrity you know i recognized that he had a clinical roi out of this it was the patient his clinical roi was the patient and his work ethic and i think he will be the first to tell you so here's another lesson for those who are considering being part of developing uh, uh, digital health with another entity, I think he will be the first to tell you, and he's already smiling, he probably knows what I'm going to say, we don't always agree on points, do we, Dr. C? But we have communication about what we feel is important to patients, and more importantly, we allow each other to ask questions and 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 then that learning takes place you see so if you're going to commit to being part of developing a digital health platform first of all feel the trust it was there for me i i knew it i knew it from him as a surgeon but i knew it from him as a person of integrity and, and strong work ethic and why, why he was doing this. It wasn't to, you know, fill his and line his pockets. It was specifically for the patient. So that became important to me. And then 
be able to have a robust and meaningful collaborative conversation with whoever you're on board with. It's not always easy. It's not always easy, but man, is it, it has been fulfilling for me as a patient. And so no matter what digital health platform you decide to become engaged with as a patient, patient advocate, those are my, those are my sage words of advice today, I think. Thank you so much, Terry. And we're coming back to this again. It's the trust factor. Um, yeah. So I, I feel like um, naturally going to Dr. C because Terry just sets things up so beautifully for you. Um, so perhaps just because this is our last question, this is our last opportunity before the Q&A. What would you like to say about the future or about the trust factor? Yeah, I, I think um, you know what Terry's done with Deep Sea Journey is a perfect example of the the power of patient self advocacy, right? Um, you know, speaking up, educating us, the physicians, as to what's important to you. What's important to you? You, know, you look at shared decision making, and and there's no set list of what makes the list of importance. What the important factors for physicians to consider in the treatment plan is whatever's important to you as the patient, right? Because everyone's got a different life, a different job, a different support structure. I don't know what's important to you. I've just met you. How am I supposed to know, right? So the physicians or any healthcare professional needs to be open to learning as part of this collaborative two-way street. And as, as patients, I think you have to be okay kind of stepping up and pushing for that speak. You don't get what you don't ask for. So, I mean, it's what I tell my kids. It's what I tell my 17 year old. You want that? You have to get it, go get it. Right. What's the worst thing that can happen? It won't work out. That puts you in the same position you were in five minutes ago. So you've lost nothing. So go, go for it. So Terry's laughing because I've told her the same stuff as part of her foundation. That's why you're laughing. I can see you laughing. But, and then in turn, to answer your other question in terms of what we need to change and moving forward for digital health, I think the two barriers are very common in every kind of marketplace or sector, right? Money and policy. And so um, policy changes when you get the money and you, have the pay and you have the people wanting it. So that's where the patients come in. The money is coming. Uh, Terry and I are really, I'm going to speak for you here, Terry, because I know how you feel. Uh, we're very, very excited to be co-leads on the shared decisions and uh, precision medicine group for the World, for the World Health Care Innovation Summit, World Health Innovation Summit, WIS. Mm -hmm. um, that's where money is coming from to fund the projects that will further the cause. And now that's encouraging industry to come in because now it's financially viable, right? So, so that's the catalyst, as well as the uh, f finally industry is realizing where, that, that, that there's money to be made in prevention. Okay. And prevention, you can't have prevention again without patient involvement, shared decision-making, precision medicine, it's all completely linked. It's all one. Um, so I'm very excited for the future. I see a lot of change coming. Um, being involved uh, and talking to like-minded people like all of you excites me. Um, so thank you all for your, for your passion and pushing this forward. It's, it's the future of healthcare. Thank you so much, Dr. C. Um, Laurie, are you excited about the future? of digital health, I should yes. say. Yeah, yes, of course. As soon as it is done in a way that it will serve patients uh, and in a right way. And what I was, while I was uh, listening to all of you, I was thinking, okay, when I, I, when I started to be a patient, what if I would have in hand all the digital help, et cetera, because I didn't have, because you said previously about the non-knowledge that, that patient does have. What if I would have that in hand? And the, the answer to that would be, oh, it would have been lovely, except it if it would have been too complex for me to use, because at the time you start to be sick, basically in a cancer, and especially in the breast cancer, you are not sick before you get the treatment. 
So it means also that your brain and everything would maybe potentially will not be operating the same way as usual. So if it's become too complex to, to, to search for things, etc., then we will simply give up. So I have so big hope in the future, and yes, I'm excited by the future, and this is why I'm participating to this kind of discussion, having my certification and really willing to, to put my little stone on the, on the, on the wall. I love that, Laurie. Put your little stone on the wall. I love that. Um, Celia, I think one of the things that's coming through on this conversation, and I'm interested to hear what you think about this, is we talk about digital health. It's so much more complex. It's so much more than putting an app into a patient's hand. And I think this has really come through strong in this conversation. What are your thoughts around that, Celia, and around the future? Yeah, I, I'm also, I'm super excited to have listened to to, to all of you and um I think uh, from the industry perspective is it's the same um, appeal that Terry made to patients is like thinking through where you have an interface that you need to design with the um, patient and actually the, the healthcare professional um, to make the experience of being a patient better, right? It's the whole journey we have to look at and what is exciting is that there's so many um, technology solutions coming our way and AI and precision medicine and wearables and we'll be able to accelerate so many things. But if we get the patient experience still wrong, um, all, of, all of it will be so much more difficult or the other way around to say positively, think about all of the pain points that we can solve for the patient, but also for the healthcare professional and also for the healthcare systems because they are, you know, as we know, under a lot of strain. So um, technology is there, but if we don't get that, that, that trust, then we can't actually solve the patient experience. The patient experience will, will always be human. <laughs> It'll always be that interaction, that, that shared decision that we, came, uh, that we started the, the webinar with, right? And so it's, it's enabling it, it's supporting it. It's not, it's not um, getting rid of it, right? It's like, how can you, as uh, Dr. C did, how can you make that experience of that painful information seeking a better one? How can you make it less painful for the physician because they're under time, time constraint, right? And, and, and so it trickles down into all of this and make it also less costly for the, for the healthcare system. So we have at our fingertips all of these opportunities, but we have to redesign the, ex the whole experience with that in mind and whilst keeping the data safe and in the patient hands, right? Not giving it out and away as, you know, it's, it's already a, lo a lot of the times the case. So th the patient has to not only own their experience, but also own their data and own their decisions, right? And it's a, it's, it's a huge ask on the patient. So the whole system needs to work towards, towards that experience so that they can actually um, be at the center, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Celia. Um, I'm again, really conscious we've 10 minutes left. I have um, two extremely important uh, questions and lots of comments, people, you know, saying wonderful things about the panel, but um, Terry here, um, Here's a question uh, from, please forgive me if I've pronounced your name wrong, uh, Chien. Uh, Chien says that uh, patients should be involved in all phases from design to the research study, to analyze and interpret the data, to disseminate the results. As a breast cancer survivor and someone who works with Asian cancer survivors or patients, I know cultural and language barriers often prevent people from accessing the important information and support. How can digital health remove these barriers? And um, Terry will be interested in this because Chien says, for example, I can't even find any information about deep, I I'm sorry, I probably pronounced that wrong as well, deep uh, flap surgery info in Chinese. Um, Terry, did you, tell me what you think about this uh, comment or question. Oh, Chien. Well, first of all, thank you for the work you're doing. And boy, I, I have goosebumps. My background is an e as an ESL teacher. So if you can't find the information now, I'm like, okay, maybe we need to uh, connect and chat. Um, 
Thank you. Yeah. So, ooh, that I don't even know how to answer that right now, other than to say, um, you know, I've set up. Th this becomes a barrier for me sometimes because I've set up this global community um, with my closed face group, Facebook group, but then sometimes I have patients that are on there that speak another language and I'm like, oh my gosh, how, how are we going to get around this? So Chen, I think all that I can encourage you to do is to reach out to people in your local community, um, your oncologist, your physical therapist, um, it, it, curate your own group, curate your own group and begin to connect with healthcare professionals that surround themselves um, in the patient, you know, in the breast cancer space to understand, you know, how you could collaboratively work together. It's not easy. I'm not going to tell you it isn't, but I encourage you to do that. Um, this, I, I just have to very quickly go back to something that Laurie said. I think when we think about terms, when, when you think about facilitators of shared decision making, the terms all, almost become facilitators. So you walk into a new classroom anywhere and, and you sign up for it. Maybe it's a class you didn't want to sign up for, like breast cancer, okay? But you have to take this class and you've got a stellar, uh, you know, uh, grade point average and you want to keep your A and you want to do good. Well, that's what digital health can do. And Chien, that's what your community can do. Start establishing those, those pieces of information that can help patients understand what they're going through and what their options are. Um, because when you establish them and they're there, they can go back and look at them. It's like when you walk into that new classroom, you start viciously taking down notes or typing on your laptop. This is what I need to know. But then you can take those and go back and study them later, take the time to understand them so that when you go in to a consult and talk to someone, then, then you have that empowerment and that understanding of what you can talk about. So, Chen, I, I'm not sure I answered your question fully. You you have a challenge, but I, I'm, I'm empowering you to take that challenge and do what you can in your community. Um, Terry, thank you. And again, and I'm just going to bring in a question from Rob. Unfortunately, we just do not have the time to really delve into these questions, but it's important that we put them out there. So Chan's point about um, those barriers around language and culture is extremely important. Celia, I feel like we have a whole other webinar that we need to do. Um, <laughs> and we certainly may probably, there's a lot here that we need to unpick. Um, thank you again, Terry, as well. Uh, Chan, I know that Terry is extremely open and extremely welcoming. So again, if you, you get in touch uh, with with us at Maricoy and we can put you in touch with Terry. Thank you, Terry. I want to bring Rob in. Rob, I'm not sure if we're going to get the, the opportunity to really answer this question because it, there's a lot in it. But again, thank you for the question. Rob says it's all about allowing the patient to make an informed decision, be it either to participate in a clinical trial or choosing the right treatment plan. But to make an informed decision, it's more than just the medical decision. It's a holistic decision, including work, patient and caregiver impact, psychosocial considerations. So it technology evolving rapidly, how does the patient gather all of the input to make that informed decision? Where do they start? And he's also asked, how do they find the best trial for them? I'm not sure if, if Laurie or Celia or Dr. C wants to come in on that. Again, just being conscious of time. Um, if you've got maybe something quite quick you can say, although it's, it's a large question. Um. Well, we're actually, um, there are several avenues that we're pursuing right now to, to connect patients who have same similar experiences with each other, uh, preferably globally. There are a couple of projects I'm, I'm involved with. Um, I, I think that's definitely, uh, this touches back again on the, the future of digital health and, and uh, the other comments that have been made about patient data and patient sharing. Um, you know, how, how great would it be if everyone 
could access trials that their own physician didn't know about because they connected with a patient with the same disease halfway across the world, right? And so um, there, are, there are companies that are working on this uh, right now. Um, I think there are going to be, you know, several, uh, several projects like this uh, that, that are going to be coming through. Uh, right now, this very second, uh, to do that, it's very hard. Um, so, th unfortunately, you know, the only, uh, uh, the trials that are available, you can, you can go to the reputable um, uh, websites. Uh, uh, in, in the U.S., for example, there's a, there's a, there are a couple of websites, you know, .gov websites and, and other reputable uh, organizations that have legit, all the legitimate trials listed. Uh, for breast cancer, you can access them all through the Breast Advocate app, for example. Um, and then beyond that, trying to get in touch with other patients who have had similar experiences. Unfortunately, that's all down to social media. And I recommend if you're going to do that, make sure it's a legitimate group um, that uh, is not completely open to the public that you have to join, that's moderated. Um, for breast cancer, for example, there's no better example than the deep sea journey uh, that checks all those boxes. Um, so, yeah, we have work to do, and this, that's one of the opportunities for digital health, right? It's to, it's to provide you, Rob, exactly with exactly what you're talking about. I mean, you've touched on well, the, the, the core of shared decision-making and precision medicine right there. So that, that's what that, that's what we're all aiming to do is get to the point where you know exactly how to go about uh, dealing with every point that you mentioned in your question. Thank you. I'm going to bring you in, Celia, and I'm actually going to just say those who need to get off the call now, um, that that's absolutely fine. As I said, it's recorded. You can watch the recording later. But I'm conscious that there are some excellent questions here, and I really don't want to leave people hanging. So if it's okay with the panelists, we might run over a little bit of time. Um, if that's okay with everybody, if you need to go, completely understand, and I thank you for your time. Um, but I, I just feel that there are some really good comments and, and questions here. Um, so please, if you need to go, just that's absolutely fine. And again, for those listening in, there will be a recording, and I encourage you to come back and listen to the extended version, the director's cut of this webinar. Um, Celia, I'd like to bring you in here on, on maybe Rob's question or, or any of the questions that are, that are coming in, because I know you can probably see them in the chat there as well. Yeah, so Rob's question, there was another one about what is the best apps, etc. And I think the best apps are um, exactly those type of um, projects as uh, Dr. C and Terry have worked on. It's when a community um, sees that there's a problem and solves it, right? And it doesn't usually start off, you know, super technology savvy, right? Um, it, 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 but it's a it's a pain point and it gets solved. So clinical trial curation, for example, is something that many Facebook groups or social media communities do beautifully, and they do the best job of it because they not only provide the information, but they give patients also sort of like a way to understand how that clinical trial is relevant to them, for example, right? And so I think when we can see those opportunities, the, the solutions that, that communities have already started to work on, then the next step is to look at it and say, oh, how can we now put this on steroids with um, technology? How can we uh, sponsor this, support this, partner um, this with bigger organization, with money, with access, <laughs> etc.? cetera? So, um, I think it's the, the best solutions are actually the ones that, again, came out of that community of trust, are solving a very concrete problem that the patient or the patient and the physician have. And then you add all of the other layers of the onion around it, um, you know, to, to make it stronger and, uh, and, and a more um, scalable solution. I really like that, Celia. So what you're saying is, and, and this ties in with what Dr. C and, and Terry have said as well, um, there's a need. First of all, you start with a need, and it's the community who define the need. 
uh, the patient community to find the need. And then what you're saying as well is see what's working, what are the patients doing, and how can you scale that digitally? I think that's a great answer as well. Stacy, um, oh no, Amina, uh, Amina, you have um, you have a big question around this as well. There are so many different digital health apps today. Uh, the fragmentation is a problem for patients. You're looking at your phone. You'd only want one to download, but there's so many. Are there any that you would recommend as an all-encompassing per region? I'm not sure we're going to be able to answer that question for you, but I think perhaps, um, and again, please come in here, but what I'm hearing from the panel on that is that go to your patient community and see what they recommend, see what they're using. And again, it's going back to that patient community again that's coming through really, really strongly. So I hope that answers your question, Nina. Um, I wanted to say thank you to Stacy and to Neil and to Oriana and to Casey for your comments. Uh, thank you so much again. So sorry that I can't get to them all. Um, Oriana is speaking about uh, Pharma Ledger. I haven't heard of Pharma Ledger before. Um, Oriana tells us that uh, Pharma Ledger is working to find digital solutions, protecting patients' data, and co-creating digital health as well. There are several organizers or several companies in that space. It's a really important space. Um, and again, just Stacy. Stacy wants us to, us to tell her uh, who's doing it right, who's doing something revolutionary. Uh, do you have any examples to share with us? Um, so I might actually finish on that question as well. And, and again, just give everybody a chance just to, just to perhaps just wrap up really briefly with their thoughts around, around the webinar and around anything that they want to say. Uh, so, uh, Laurie, I'm, I'm, would you would you like to come in? A, as a patient, was there any particular digital app that, that you found useful, or did you turn to digital or to apps to help you on your your cancer journey? This is exactly the point, and this is why I wanted to come today. Is that I didn't find anything because I was not aware of anything. And okay, maybe this is the country I'm living in. I will not comment on that. But uh, this is, I think, the difficulty today for patient is that. There is two categories, in my eyes, there is two categories of patients. They are the one who are following what the doctors say and they don't want to hear more than that and that's it. And there are the patients that are, I don't know, are willing to get more information. And also, it's not only, and I, I like someone said that it's not only about medical things or medical information, but it's about all of the rest. How will I continue to work with my disease? How I will have to organize my calendar <laughs> with all the, 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 the appointment I have and things like that. And I, so I, to answer your question, no, I didn't find any app right now and I would love to have one, uh, to find one clearly. And this is why I would like also to help building that. Two is maybe a recommendation to Amina is that what are you looking for? Because even when you use an app for traveling, for example, it's not like an uh, app called travel because it can be about the time schedule, it can be about the translation, it can be about the uh, currency exchanges or this, whatever. So to be a little bit more specific on what I'm looking for on, as an app, is it about information? Is it about um, uh, patient community? So can I can, sorry, I can get tips on how to, work with my disease or is it about different things so i think i'm not sure one app would solve everything <laughs> because it, it's so complex so that it will be uh yeah, i think we we better to have deeper uh information or apps solving different things but i didn't find any so if you have any i would love to have one <laughs> Thank you, Laurie. And then I'm um, just, I'm actually going to have to bring this conversation to a close. Uh, it's been an extremely enriching conversation. The words that keep coming back again and again is information, trust, going back to your patient community. This conversation took a, a, a turn that I wasn't quite expecting, but I think that's the wonderful thing about getting a group of people together that are absolutely passionate about the work you do. And it really, really shines through. So I want to say again, thank you so much to Terry, to Dr. C, to Laurie, and to Celia. Thank you for your passion. Thank you for what you do for patients. And 
and thank you to everybody who's who's stayed with us and tuned in and asked wonderful questions and chats uh, in the chat box as well i feel that this conversation isn't over there seems to be a lot more so we look forward to welcoming you to more webinars like this in the future and i'd just like to wish you all a, a good evening or a good day depending on where you are in the world and with that we're going to uh stop the recording and uh